Welcome back. This is The Big Issue on TV3 New Day. Good morning to you again. If you just tuned in, we're glad that you decided to join us this morning. We're going to be discussing very pertinent issues, making waves um, across the media platforms. And we have the people here, of course, to discuss it, um, representatives of the various political parties in the country. I'll start off by introducing Dr. Sharif Khalid. Uh, he's the Associate Professor in Accounting and Financial Management at the University of Sheffield, UK, and a member of NDC's National Communications team. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. How are you doing? Good. Nice to have me here again. Exactly. This yeah. will be the second time yeah. that we're seeing you. I'm so not <laughs> Oh, well, I think you did the first time you came here anyway. Yeah. But I know you're also hoping to run um, to represent the NDC in WA. Yeah. Okay, how's that going? Well, pretty much, uh, I, it's not my first time. I've yeah. been uh, I've been there before. Mm. Yeah, my big brother has inspired most of us too. So we've been there before and then we are warming up too once you again. Are. Okay, yeah, hopefully, well, I'll come inshallah. back to you shortly yeah. just so you can tell me a bit about what you make of the situation in WA yeah. at the moment. But also in the city is Bernard Mona. He is a former chairman of the People's National Convention. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I could have been better. Mm. But you are better. This morning you came and you drank some nice chocolate. So And that should tell you. When I was taking it, Kamal said that, oh, this is my breakfast table. <laughs> is it? Before that, I could not take breakfast at home. And I had to do breakfast <laughs> here. It's indicative but, of the lack of cash of at home. Is that the real reason or because you had to leave home early? Oh, no, 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 no. no. I, You're not I, being mischievous I, this no, morning. No, no, I've always left home early. Okay. In fact, before coming here, I have a regular routine. I have to do some workouts, and oh, I have okay. to necessarily do it before I come here. Mm. But you, so as you sit down, you don't have money to buy food. Nothing. <laughs> come out, sort you out. Don't worry. Which come out. Come out, Dean. Yes, <laughs> yeah. As well, come out, Dean Adelai is the deputy director <laughs> of communications for the NPP. Cashman. <laughs> he, he says you should pass him some cash so Accept he can buy breakfast. Accepting it in good faith, and um, <laughs> you know, I think his breakfast is not too. Mm, Expensive. How much is a bottle of? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not and sure. And it's solid to be. I'm not sure. You're not sure how much it costs. Oh, okay. It is, I mean, it is solid. It's uh, solid. Can you give a rough estimate of how much it costs? I, I won't attempt because I don't. No, he wants to. Pay for I, it. I want yeah. to tell you why he has so much to buy, even a box of this. Uh, <laughs> okay, and, and <laughs> pretend not to have anyway. So, but that's fine. Good morning. Aren't you going to have some? Uh, I'm oh, gonna, you I, I, I've always had some, and it's it's quite. Great. I mean, yeah. the guys are doing so well. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, good it's, rich. And it's very rich. Mm. It's rich as well. But you had yeah. a good start of the week so far. I did. Um, I did. I did. You <coughs> know, uh, let me admit that we are in difficult times. Mm. I mean, and it's globally um, acknowledged that um, economies are struggling. Mm. Um, you know, physical policies that actually. Um, hitherto before the external shocks were churned out mm. are indeed um, suffering because of the challenges that they have encountered. So it's not just about Ghana alone, but I would always set off by apologizing to Ghanaians and indicating to them that look, better times ahead, light at the end of the tunnel. We shouldn't throw our hands in despair. Um, the economy is going to bounce back and bounce back so well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we're going to go into it yes, deeply. We will, so let, but essentially, it is important for us to acknowledge that we have work to do as a people, mm -hmm. and we must continue to do that work and give support to ourselves, and then paint that positive picture out there, mm -hmm. so that at least we we'll have an outlook that will invite people okay. to come support us and give us a very good, if you like. Um, you know, back in yeah. going forward. Well, if you bought some niche chocolate or niche cocoa drink, let us know how much you had to buy it for. It would be nice to know, at least so we can rightly inform Kamal about it. I think he intends to buy, you know, cartons no, for he all of intends. us. I mean, I know, I, I'm telling oh, you he that intends. he can so buy. Not you. Okay. He loves it, okay. and I also love it as well. Exactly. But he so comes to have his breakfast here because of maybe access, availability where he is is a problem. So, so it's possible that we get some here. So. I'm asking Come again. you, why are you... Oh, well, why not? I will be fine if uh, I, I should be able to buy at least a bottle each. of it. I should be able to buy that. Oh, you that's know, not a problem, that right? That's, that should anyway, be I hope you enjoy some niche cocoa drink <laughs> while you're watching us this morning as, as you step out uh, for your day. Whether it's work, school, uh, you can yeah. opt for the 750 ml bottle or the Tetra Pack, or you can go for the sachet, mix it with hot water, and you're good to go. There's also the niche chocolate paste mixed with peanuts and it's very tasty. Go for the niche chocolate itself as well as a gift or just for yourself and enjoy. But quickly before we get into our conversation about <coughs> IMF and of course the economy at the moment, 
of course, if you're running for or hoping to run uh, to represent WA, then it's necessary that we talk about you know, residents and the fact that they are alarmed by the incessant disappearance of private security guards in the area. We're told by the police that a key suspect has been arrested. But what do you make of this situation? Well, it's, it's quite a, a bizarre and disturbing situation, as uh, you'd have read in the news. It's uh, the entire region. I was there. I only just returned a few days back, mm. so I could, uh, I had at first uh, had experience a sort of tensions that went on and youth agitations mm. uh, as regards the current uh, situation that's been panning out. I, I think that, yes, uh, security has been responded responsibly because okay. there's some calm now in there. Mm. And, you know, security and intelligence issues are quite, you know, very difficult, but when they step in, they do help a lot because we haven't. But these are things that have been going on from time to time, occasionally. But it seemed to be coming a trend. But most of what is emanating now is actually grapevine information and rumors. So it's not as concrete as it should be because, uh, and I think that that's my worry in mm. which these situations are handled. Immediately a suspect was picked up, pictures were circulated yeah. all over the place. They've not ascertained whether it's him, mm -hmm. right? Now information is so emanating from the grapevine that, uh, you know, lend credence to the fact that he is mentally disabled. Mm. That's another interesting dimension. Just within 24 or less than 24 hours of his arrest or adoption, this is what is happening. Yeah. So, and some shallow graves, the very disturbing ones are the mm -hmm. shallow graves that have mm -hmm. been discovered. You're mm -hmm. talking about some body parts body that parts, are not, exactly. the, as to the trend, we don't know. Maybe we need a full autopsy report mm. from the police to establish that. I do understand that top security couples are already in the region, which mm -hmm. uh, gives confidence to the fact that the situation has really been put on the high alert. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that the citizens would cooperate. But if mm -hmm. you look at it, possibly I'm thinking of a possible state of emergency as one of the issues to look at, mm -hmm. possible uh, you know, timelines, uh, closure of uh, or monitoring exit and entry points to the region, yeah. if this is what is actually happening, and also increasing police patrols. Mm -hmm. I think that if these measures are instituted and they work with informants within the region, because uh, why it's become very attractive to uh, foreigners from the sub-region. Mm. You know, we have some Nigerians, Burkina Bays all coming in because business is growing bigger and the likes of that. Mm. So, and also some, you know, major routes that lead to these um, uh, sub-regional capitals yeah. or cities. So I think that it's important that uh, security is beefed up. I'm sure RECSEC is probably looking into it. And uh, as it stands now, I wouldn't want us to feed so much on the rumor mail, but all I would appeal to the citizenry of, or the indigents of WISE is to be calm and then cooperate with security services to see how effective right. we could de all deal with this and put situation. an amicable solution yeah. to it. Very it's quite disturbing. Yeah. yeah, it is very. But yeah. the one now was speaking, and he said that the response of the police was a knee-jerk reaction because this has been ongoing for the last five months, in some cases we're told even longer, nine months, where some seven security <coughs> officers have disappeared over time. And they continuously alerted <coughs> the police about it. But there was really no deliberate attempt to nip it in the bud until the situation happened where they actually discovered body parts as well. And so he thought that, yes, they've done a good job by coming to see them, but they could have done better when they started. What do you say? Well, good morning. Uh, good morning to the overlord of the Wala mm. Traditional Council, um, to my brother, Sheriff, that I've not seen in a while, and of course, Kamal. Mm. Um, I don't know why this morning you assembled a northern <laughs> kennel. Um, you, are, you are falling in love with the north, I guess. <laughs> that could be true. <laughs> um, it's, it's obvious that it's better late than never. Ever since this incident of adoption started in the Upper West Region, I have been very concerned mm. and I've been in constant touch with the security agencies, particularly the police, the regional command. On a regular basis, I try to find out from particularly the regional commander mm. what the situation was. And the regional commander, just as anybody, if you know why, there is a popular cliche amongst us, mm. Tija Okay, what is it? Meaning mean? we are all the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are all the same. And so anytime somebody commits a crime or run violence mm -hmm. of the law, you arrest the person and society's response is that so leave the person or release him for us to go and deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. So if you are a security person dealing with people who consider themselves as a family, we are of the same. 
it's sometimes difficult for you to want to apply the law to the fullest. Mm. And so Tidabunyen has been the thing. If you arrest Sheriff, I'll come and tell you how we are related. <coughs> Families will come and say, look, this matter, let's go and deal with it. If you arrest Kamal, we'll come and tell you how related we are, leave the matter. Yeah. And so you must understand the local dynamics in dealing with this security situation. Mm. And sometimes some, we find that the security agencies, look, they want to apply the law, but hey, they must also appreciate our way of life. And so this matter happened, and seriously so, that these adoptions started. Two things you must say. These institutions that want security persons don't provide security posts for these persons that are there. If you go to most of the areas where these people were adopted, they just say, come and be security of a school. Yeah. No security post. The school is not even walled. And so you are just there, and you find the most appropriate shed, and you go and lie down. When sleep catches you, somebody is coming. You may not recognize instantly that somebody is intruding. And before you realize, you are harmed. So it is important that as we look at this, we must also say that, look, when you want a security to man a place, you must also provide some security posts and some surveillance material so that we'll be able to <coughs> capture these things. Some of these areas that these attacks took place, no electricity. Mm. And when the place is not littered or lighted, mm -hmm. you will get the impression that, look, anybody can calmly just go in there and do something and run away. And the last one that happened mm -hmm. as the uh, special needs or SDA school, mm -hmm. the regional commander, if you listen to him, mm -hmm. and I actually call him, this person was sleeping under some canopy, mm -hmm. and then the assailants just got there and threw a heavy block on him. Mm -hmm. So he shouted, and a lady who was living within then rushed out of her room only to realize that the watchman was affected. So she started. The neighbors came and said, what is it? Then she just said, watchman, watchman, watchman. Mm. So when she started saying watchman, one of the neighbors took her phone and was able to place a call to the regional commander. At that late hour, the regional commander took off before he could call his team mm. to arrive at the place. Okay. Now when the, the regional commander got there, the patrol team arrived, and then they said the people are taken to the Nakori Road. You understand yeah. what I mean. So they took a chase after those people. They saw them. They entered into the cashew plantation on the mm. left side and put up their motorbike. How they escaped? Nobody. But they left the body. They left the body. In fact, the person is currently under oh, treatment. Okay. Okay, now, two that. things I just wanted to say. If that lady did not have her phone switched on, or under the bizarre circumstances where we want to do uh, blocking of same numbers. Under that circumstance, how could she have placed a call to the regional police commander to come and rescue the situation? Mm. So sometimes when you are taking national decisions, you must understand the ramifications because just blocking a somebody's SIM card could occasion deaths and murder. And in this case, it was an active SIM card that supported the call to the police to be able to save this person, mm. whom we are told that he's currently suffering some visual impairment because, um, and the swollenness, yeah, I'm sure you will see. Exactly I just want to give two things. One, yesterday, the citizens, the youth of WA, were able to go and bring up somebody to the chief palace, yeah. suspecting the person to be um, one of the chief architects in these adoptions. And in one of the instances, as soon as they got into the person's abode, yeah. they decided to burn the <laughs> anything that they saw within there. That is tampering with some evidence. Yeah. So even as we want citizens to be involved and cooperate with the police, we must know and we must be enlightened that, look, <laughs> the material that you find there, by burning them, already you have defaced the evidence. Exactly. And sometimes it will be difficult for the security agencies to proceed. Okay. And if they are not able to proceed, we will return and say that, look, the security agencies, they left this matter to go. But I'm happy that the Minister for Interior, who is an indigenous of the region, the Inspector General of Police, yeah. uh, were all there yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm also told that about 300 police officers have been dispatched and they are currently in the region. They have sent in some motorbikes and because if these criminals are using motorbikes, 
then you cannot chase them with a car. And that is how come that the regional police and the patrol team could not chase them. Because when you get to a place and the motorbikes can go and the car yeah. cannot go. So these motorbikes will come okay. in to help us. And I, I just hope and pray that we'll be able to come to an end in this matter. Mm. Um, the final point I want to make is that whilst we are dealing with the situation in the Upper West Region, where, let's not forget the situation in Boko yeah, is yeah. not that 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 police stand for me yeah. and I'm I'm just worried about the extent of laxity mm -hmm. that our security we're told that about. yesterday there were gunshots that were recorded yeah it is well, terrible so and I'm, I'm not I'm not the least but, enthused about the situation but, at but all. come out can the people of Wabi rest assured that peace and calm will be restored in their community and they won't have to walk um, you know without having to look behind them for fear of being kidnapped or being murdered looking at the situation at the moment not just the people of Wa. Um, the entire citizenry of this country needs to be assured that our peace and security is guaranteed mm. um, at all times. I mean, it's so important to us. Um, crime, indeed, is something that doesn't know who the victim will be. It could be you, it could be me, it could be whoever tomorrow. Mm. Okay, so the authorities that are supposed to work, okay, round the clock to ensure that indeed we have excellent security put in place, they shouldn't joke with it at yeah. all. I mean, what happened in the Upper West Region and what, is, or what has been happening in the Upper West Region is something that we all need to be concerned about and uh, we all need to talk about. Because a single life lost is indeed very, very um, hard hitting to us as a people. And we never know what that person is going to contribute in the future for us, mm -hmm. as it were. So the, 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 the curtailment of such a human resource um, to us is indeed a worry. Um, I am happy that some over 300 police, uh, we are told, yeah. have been deployed now. Visibility is going to be key. It shouldn't just be, if you like, um, a nine-day wonder mm -hmm. that you start today because people are talking about it the next moment we don't see them again. I mean, it should be something that would be given that continuity. Um, the interior minister spoke yesterday. I listened to him. I also listened to the IGP. Um, believe, I believe they're really going to take up this matter seriously okay. and then look into it. The cooperation also that we're looking for from citizens okay, to the security agencies is also very key and very important. But like my brother Bernard put it, we need to educate people the more. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. Tampering with evidence, how many of us know that, you know, taking the law into our own hands to damage properties, to fight the person, to even try to kill mm -hmm. or to, 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 to maim whoever you suspect is bad. How many of us know about it? I mean, we need to be educated properly on how citizens are supposed to effect the arrest, how citizens are supposed to collaborate with the security agencies as it were. It is something that we need to take up seriously and talk to the people about. But by and large, I'm happy that at least some measures have been put in place and um, also saying that we shouldn't just look at only, you know, the Upper West Region. We should look at the nation in a whole and, of course, see to it that our security is guaranteed as yeah. it were. Indeed. Well, um, be rest assured for those of you especially who live in the uh, capital city of the Upper West Region. Yes, the police are on top of their job and they will do what they ought to do to keep you protected. But let's uh, move on now to our main topic for today. And we'll talk about the IMF. Of course, July 1 was when there was an official communique from the Ministry of Information indicating that the president had asked the finance minister and Ken Ophore Atta to commence formal engagements with the IMF for some economic support. A lot of stakeholders shared their views on this. Some were not in favor. Others said, well, it wasn't surprising, but they expected that we should have gone there much earlier. Then there was that debate about whether really our current economic situation was as a result of bad governance, bad economic management, or as a result of external factors. COVID, Ukraine, Russia war. The debate has been ongoing. Of course, the government officials indicating that it has really been as a result of COVID, Russia, Ukraine war. Not too long ago, uh, we had the, um, the director of uh, IMF indicating that it really was as a result of external factors, which is why we are where we, ha we are today. And former President John Dramani Mahama spoke to Alfred Okanse on this matter. Let's listen to him indicating why he thinks that it was really self-inflicted and not as a result of external factors. Take a look. We know that the current mess we are in was not caused only by external factors. A large part of the causative factors for the situation we are in are policies, bad policies. 
and I'll just give you uh, a few examples. One, um, let's take the banking sector clean out. Then aside from that, you mortgage everything, Energy Sector Levy Act, you form ESLA PLC, and then you mortgage it till 2035. And so it's part of our petroleum buildup, but you've taken that money in advance and spent it. And so you have no flexibility when it comes to petroleum pricing anymore, because that is a fixed debt. And to 2035, when you finish paying, it says, oh, it was caused by external factors and all bad policies, uh, policies. It's because she does not know. She's either unaware or she was being diplomatic. Those are the two excuses I can give. But when they make mistakes like that, it is for us who know to correct them. And that is why I put that tweet out. No, but uh, the IMF is, uh, they, they came, gathered data, were engaging to develop our own program. Such information about the state of the economy cannot be unknown to the IMF boss in, 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 in negotiations. It wouldn't have reached their attention yet. By now, the information gathered would be at the desk of the one in charge of Africa. The, they have directors in charge of the different regions. It wouldn't have escalated. She probably will get a summary paper or something. But I don't think that at the stage at which they are, she would have gotten a full picture of what is happening. That's what I'm saying. I'm ready to uh, accept that she's probably not well briefed. Or if she was even properly briefed, she probably was trying to be diplomatic in, in what she said. And that's former President John Dramani Mahama, of course, explaining why he still disagreed with Kristalina Georgieva, who is the director of IMF, indicating that there were some extraneous factors that, um, you know, resulted in why we had to go to the IMF. In fact, now uh, we've heard from the director of communications at the IMF, uh, Jerry Rice, who also has spoken on this matter, says they back what the director had said. And in actual fact, uh, the reason why Ghana came for support from the IMF was because of extra uh, or external factors listen to him speak as well and then we'll come back and have the conversation no matthew which which you asked about and then alex asked about as well uh, ghana uh, has as you probably know requested a program from the imf we had a, a an imf staff team in accra in july to begin uh, initial discussions with the ghanaian authorities um, and um, we characterized that mission as, as constructive, kick-started the process and laid the groundwork for engagement, which now continues. Our, our mission chief for the IMF also recently visited Accra again to meet with key counterparts. And we're hopeful for another visit in the coming weeks. Don't, I don't have the date for you, but in the coming weeks. And, um, I mean, on, on, on your point, Matthew, uh, I mean, I think I would say, as a, just to repeat, the war in Ukraine has triggered a global, a global economic shock that's hitting Ghana and, as I said, many other countries, and all at a time when, for many of these countries, their room for fiscal manoeuvre, if I could put it that way, is already extremely limited because they've used a lot of fiscal power already, firepower already in uh, the pandemic. So the shock coming from the war in Ukraine compounds other pressing policy challenges, and um, we're well, we're we're very cognizant. So that is Jerry Rice. He's the director of communications for the IMF, also reiterating what his director had said, that, of course, there were some external factors that led to where we are at the moment as a country. And so in this case, I mean, why is the NDC, of course, based on what former President John Ramani Mahama said, and also yeah. some communicators have also insisted yeah. that it is self-inflicted and really not about what happened globally. Why are you still insisting on that? Yeah, well, I, I very much agree with... Uh President Mahama, mm. uh, based on his position. And uh, I think the IMF, I would say, the IMF and the World Bank or the British Universal Institutions have contradicted themselves and I would give evidence to that effect. Okay. So in 2019, they had a joint altered report on debt analysis of the country, which indicated that we had a very high debt risk. Mm. 
Right, so these were alarm bells already sounded by the British News Institution, not just the IMF, but the IMF and the World Bank. And this was a joint report which said that we're servicing so much on debt, right? We're using revenues being generated to service a lot of debt. And these were warnings that were already coming. So how could you turn around today to say that it's a train burden, which is a PR communication line that has been whipped in by the government to be using from day-to-day -day activities in terms of the defense of these issues? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, uh, in a way, bring in historical perspectives as to what has happened in the past to tell you that this is self-inflicted. OK, when was or when did the WHO declare the COVID pandemic? Mm. This was in January 2020. Yeah. And I'm referring to this joint report of December 2019. Mm. So it tells you that there's something already happening as far as the economy is concerned or going wrong as far as the economy is concerned. Now, let me take you back to the NDC going to the IMF in 2015. When the NDC was to go to the IMF, we had all sort of interesting statements that any idiot can go to the IMF. But what happened that Ghanaians are not even preview to is that when the government came in, in 2018, they extended the NDC's IMF facility by a year, yeah. mm -hmm. which went on forward to what? April 2019. So they still benefited from that, which cushioned the economy. Mm -hmm. So if any idiot could go to the IMF, and the people who, very people who went to the IMF, you came in and you found it prudent enough to have an ex, a one-year extension of the very credit facility they went after, then that's a very interesting perspective. But was the economy not growing? And in fact, we're told that we had one of the fastest growing Well, if it was growing, uh, why economies? extend for Even a year? before COVID hit. So if, if it was growing, why extend? Why do you go to the IMF? You go for support. You go for stability. You go for economic stability. You go for economic management. Mm. You go for currency stability. So if all of these indicators were right, why extend a whole year? Right? Mm. So you move on to Russia, Ukraine. If you look at the escalations of Russia, Ukraine, and the real assault of it, mm. it was in February 2022. Again, juxtapose that to this IMF or the joint report of the IMF and the World Bank, which came in in 2019, and deduce from yourself as to whether it was actually the twin burden of COVID 19 mm. and uh, the Russia Ukraine mm. war. In any case, you would realize that. It's a global phenomenon, and it has external factors. We cannot say that it did not touch Ghana or Ghana is not experiencing that. But what we're saying is that why are other economies going on? And also, this government has benefited from or advertised that it has established or probably initiated the greatest of what? Developmental and economic projects, 1D, 1F, and the likes of that. Why do we have such projects? We have them such that when you have external shocks, they step in, right? to sort of neutralize the economy. Mm. So can we boast of any of the 1D, NF, uh, 1D, 1F projects coming into the fore to say that, OK, well, this has been able to insulate uh, the country or the economy against external shocks? As we speak, uh, in, I think that's uh, the COVID pandemic, we did go back to the IMF for another 100 million. Mm. And 100 million, we're talking about a duration payment of what? 30 years. 30 years at 0.5%, right, with a service charge of about 1.9. That's a lot, looking at the duration of that. So this government alone, if this facility goes off, have probably been to the IMF or the World Bank or the British Woods Institution three times. Leave that aside and go back to the bond market. We've been running an economy on bonds in the last seven years. Who does that? Then right. any, okay. And that, I'll, I'll still come to that. Very important points that I need to establish. I'll okay. anchor on this, right? Okay. And <laughs> let, let, <laughs> no, let, me, let me finish that. With okay, Bella. land on this, please. Yeah, so I'm going to give you an inherent risk okay. right, that we have been faced with. Uh, we are in a country that everyone ignores. Now, how much this point until the government gives a response to it? We have an economy where we have a finance minister who was possibly in the private sector from data, from data bank stock, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. From there... We have one of his contemporaries from the data bank stock who runs SEC, the Securities and Exchanges Commission, yeah. and that's a regulatory powerhouse when it comes to mm. our lead financial markets, right? Yeah. Then we have one who used to sit at the central bank's board setting monetary policy, right? Then we have another at the GIPC, which, who is meant to bring in investors and has direct funding from the office of the finance minister. Mm -hmm. This in and of itself is an inherent risk. It is? It is. How so? How not so? Any investor sitting in, you know, in a boardroom in Geneva, in Boston, anywhere in the world coming in would say, this is an inherent risk. 
corporate governance wise, it's wrong, okay. right? So why should you have people from the same institution who are friends, could be viewed as bodies, right? Control the financial architecture of a single economy, which is a sovereign state. Even if they are qualified for that position? Well, are they the only qualified people? Qualified. Are they the only qualified people? Let's not move from there. Then you juxtapose this to the national security setup. Mm -hmm. And the national security setup, as you would know, have direct relevance to do with our financial stability as well. Mm -hmm. right? As Kamal would know, the Dankwa Institute has become an ideological training ground right, for appointments into key government positions. And you're saying this based on what? I'll give you the facts. As we speak now, the current national security coordinator is an ex-executive director of the Dankwa Institute. Right? He mm -hmm. used to be the deputy mm -hmm. and just got shoehorned to be head of the national security. Does he qualify the, for the position that he occupies? Well, do you not have intelligence officers that are in role? Has, has he, where has he been an intelligence officer before until this role? But okay. we have an internal intelligence set setup. Okay. I'm not saying he's not qualified. I'm mm. just giving you the trajectory and how these things can have an impact on us. We have a whole intelligence set that people have gone to intelligence training and all of that. Oh. Right? The current BNI boss comes from the Dankwa stock. Right. I wouldn't want to go into your party matters to say your deputy general secretary and your boss who's director of communications. I, I, it's from the were, I knew you as were well. going to get there eventually. But it's, not, so. it's not my business anyway. I'm looking <laughs> at the economy. But I'm just trying to paint that picture of how this... So all of these, because these intelligence issues and when we have them within a close knit or cycle of people, right, it becomes problematic. We are talking about qualification. Okay. But we're talking about the setup and how these operational issues would happen. Okay. Let me bring Bernard Mona in. I mean, based on all the things that he has said, do you agree? I mean, are these issues really internal? Are they self-inflicted? Or can we still continue to blame COVID, Russia, Ukraine, like IMF is insinuating at this point? For several years, for several years, we decided not to invest adequately in our energy sector. And because we did not invest heavily, in power generation in our nation. We are overrun by power shortages because the demand for power, population demand, industrial demand, made us to run deficit of power supply in this country. That led to heavy effects on our nation as we Christian it doom so. In order to overcome this one. We're not wait, waiting for divine providence that our Kosombo Dam will be filled by rain. It took a government to commit itself that we will do everything possible to augment the power generation in this country. Mm. For nearly 20, for two years or so, industry had to run at less than half capacity. Two years, four years. For less than half capacity. Any nation whose industrial base is running less than half capacity certainly means that you are underproducing mm. and therefore you cannot augment the level of productive figures and uh, economic growth that you, you wanted. Mm -hmm. Somehow, by the close of 2016, we were able to bring in, even if it's at high cost, the needed infrastructure that augmented generation of power and we virtually dealt with the issues. So those industries that were running under capacity for the past four years leading to 2016, will now start to operate at optimum capacity. What did you think will happen the following year when the economy was picking up because power generation is, has been augmented, all the industries will start producing? You will see that there will be a boom. There will be augmented production, and your, of course, your economic indicators will show a positive. Somehow, those economic indicators were inherited by President Akufuado, and indeed the vice president was eloquent in this. When he came in the first 100 days, started touting 117 achievements that they have done within one day, including the fact that um, they have been able to contain inflation, the currency depreciation has been attended to, and they have founded the key to the IGP. Mm -hmm. Under such circumstances, one would ask, Within that period, that it took you more than six months to do appointment, mm -hmm. to place people, what did you do technically and practically to be able to get the economic gains that you got? Mm. So it means that you are surviving on the flow over from the previous year. Mm. And so we took advantage of that. By 2017, uh, 2018, 2019, 
we have not, and we have not added one megawatts of energy to the energy stock. None. Right now, what we are even having is that the IPPs are old so much that, look, the IPPs are beginning to reduce the capacity at which they are producing, which may lead us into another chaotic situation. We are not lucky. President Akufuado, whose main mantra in opposition was that, look, we are sitting on money, and yet we are suffering. We are poor as a result of the fact that leadership was bankrupt. And that we will have all the money in this country to be able to do. We didn't need to borrow. Mm. This was fully complemented by my brother, Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, when he said that he had worked at the Bank of Ghana before, and that why every money and penny that we need to develop this nation can be located and found in Ghana. You bring in a finance minister, and the finance minister totally departs from the president's vision. Because the president doesn't believe in borrowing to um, uh, leap the economy. Mm -hmm. The vice president doesn't believe the same. But when you appointed this finance minister, the first thing he did was to start to borrow. Was it not based on the approval of the president? Or the so the president? they started to borrow. Anytime they borrowed. Unknowing to us, the finance minister's companies and his deputy or the other, uh, what do we call it, the, the minister of state, anytime we borrow, they earn some income. So they kept borrowing. And Dr. Sharif just mentioned that the IMF and World Bank came by by 2018, 2019 mm -hmm. to issue a, a, a joint statement saying that the rate at which we are borrowing, we are risking the debt <coughs> portfolio. Yeah. So already, the Britain Woods Institution admits that we're borrowing above our capacity and beyond our, our capabilities. All of a sudden, you had COVID-19. By the way, the United States that they are, they are over with, over. Over with uh -huh. the, 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 the pandemic. Uh -huh. So when they start saying that they are over, it means globally we are over. The shock yes, of really? the shock of WHO COVID. says end is in sight. They haven't said. Until but the they U.S. Decay. Joe the Biden. US is not Joe WHO. Biden has said that they are over. <laughs> Why can Ghana That's claim that? For his can can Ghana claim that we were more impacted by COVID nineteen than the United States of America? In, in in any case, Ghana is a net beneficiary of COVID nineteen. <laughs> Bella, listen to me carefully. When COVID nineteen came in, we said that look. One of the problems that COVID-19 is going to leave behind is that there is going to be food deficit within the world. And that as an agrarian society, we should take advantage of this so that we will make food availability the major export of our nation. You had your minister for agri who is interested in becoming a president, jumping from left and right, and did not take into consideration the fact that we need to augment food production. The government that most of our people here have been eating. Yeah. Go out there and check how much it costs. My friend is looking at me from that angle. <laughs> check how much it costs. So are you saying that the government that we eat is as a result of COVID-19 and Russia invasion of Ukraine? There's no doubt that external factors have always had a shock on our nation. There's no doubt. Yeah. But external factors is not just about the transient ones that have just come. Look, you are largely an import-dependent country. So you import inflation, and then you export employment. We import everything from toothpick to underwears. Everything is secondhand. And I have insisted that the only thing you don't import secondhand is the toilet paper. Oh, not everything is secondhand. Okay. <laughs> not everything. We don't import braziers secondhand. But not all of them are We secondhand. don't import uh, underwear so secondhand. If you say everything is secondhand, then we it don't, like we don't everything import, that comes into the we country has already been worn secondhand. or used by someone. We, there are new ones that are imported as oh, well. Oh, I mean, at I what, mean, go, go around the streets now. Go around the streets, and I, I, I challenge you to this. And go and check the imported secondhand things we have in this country compared with the, the imported first hands. Mm. And you will agree that even the things we wear, everything is secondhand. So those are external. COVID-19 and Russia, they are just transient. And so if you want to say that 
transient variables will impact so much on our economy, then we are in crisis. No one, it was not external factors that asked you to spend over 25 billion to close financial institutions in this country. You closed nearly 517 financial institutions in this country. Aside the banks, microfinance institutions, uh, savings and loans. And I have said here that if you go to Sankana, Sheriff, you know Sankana. Yeah. Those microfinance savings and loan institutions could give somebody 500 Ghana cities loan to start a business, to do Koko, Kose, or to Bani. No bank will give a loan of 500 cities to any of those poor people in the communities. Their businesses were being augmented by the existence of these groups, and they were doing well. They did not have to over-rely on banking institutions. After all, if you go to the entire Nadoli district, there is no bank. Mm. There, there is only a rural bank. So if you are looking for any of the state banks or even private banks, there is no bank in the Nadoli Kalil district. There was no GN bank, because I thought the GN was everywhere. Literally. GN was there. You went mm. and collapsed it. That's why I'm saying that the banks that you have collapsed, so when you go and collapse all these things and the economy has blown in your face, then you come and start singing Russia, Ukraine, then COVID-19. When indeed, if we do a balance sheet, you realize that the inflows into COVID-19 and the outflows, you see that the inflows far outweigh the outflows. How can you claim? <clears throat> Worst of all, mm. is it reasonable for you is it reasonable for you that when COVID-19 came, President Akufuado, by the stroke of a fan and by the reading of his statement, asked all hospitality industries to close down? Our drinking bars were shut, where we used to go and drink our frustrations. Then restaurants were closed. People that bought their perishables to be used maybe for one month, they lost all that capital. When COVID-19 seem to have been relaxed, you come and rather than boosting them, you impose a tax on the people of Ghana to pay yeah. COVID-19 tax. Who is causing the economic decay? But in 2019... Is I mean, that one too external? End, just, just a quick one. Our GDP was around, what, 6.5%. We're told that it would even grow to some 9%. And then COVID hit and then we sunk. Check, check, so check all the mean, indicators. Mm -hmm. Check all the indicators and the prediction that as soon as power generation in this country was stored to its maximum, the indicators indicated that we'll be growing at 8%. The projections. Mm -hmm. And so, even without Nana Akufado winning elections, every indicator showed that why the economy was going to bounce so it back. It wasn't by their doing. It was not by their doing. Because power is a major. And this is what I say. My friend from Bolgatanga who sells in the Kumasi, area. He sells in Chinga. Mm -hmm. Anytime we go to Kumasi, as soon as we arrive, we have something kebab to eat. When we had this doomso doomso going on, when he probably he kills about three animals, he refrigerates one mm. so that the next day he can. What happened? He did not have refrigerator any longer. So he had to always make sure that he killed one. And those that he had to preserve, because of Dumso Dumso, they went bad, and he, he was running out of capital. Even hairdressers hmm. lost their businesses because of Dumso. So now that Dumso was over, all these people were now at full capacity. No one will need to tell you that once energy was restored, production was going to increase and that booming was going to take place. So all the projections and indicators pointed out, by 2019, 2016, 2017, 2018 forward, we're going. What we did not do mm. is that we did not sustain because of our recklessness in okay. running into the financial market and also collapsing banks and okay. ensuring that uh, private businesses were suffocated mm. under a poor policy regime. All right. Kamala, I'll let you hold on. We have to take a break at this point. When we get back, Kamala will respond to all the issues that have been raised by our two other guests. Welcome back, and the show still continues. This is a big issue on TV3 New Day, and this segment is probably brought to you by Nish Chocolates and Nish Cocoa Drink. Kamal Dean Abdullah is on the floor, <clears throat> and so he said this is not a response, it's a submission. Yeah, I, right. I, I, ideally, I'm supposed to have my take. Okay. Of, like, um, submit what um, I have. 
on the topics you gave us before we got yeah. here, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you would have to respond to one or two matters that you find quite, you know, um, untrue mm. to, uh, on the show. As so well. I wasn't wrong to my, say my, that. You're, you're not wrong respond. entirely. I mean, <laughs> Bella, mm. on record, mm -hmm. Ghana have had to go to the Britain Wood Institution 17 times. 17 times, one, 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 17 times, on record. It is not the first time that we are seeing the government of the day with very cogent reasons seeking to get support from Britain Wood institutions. It's not the first time. The immediate one, if I remember, if I recall, was somewhere in 2015. Bella, what were the cause, causative factors? What were the causative factors that we're talking about in 2015? Mm -hmm. What led us to go to IMF? First of all, we said, okay, through our president then, John Dramani Mahama, that there's no way we will go to the IMF or there's no way we'll go to the British Wood Institutions on a BBC interview. Then came back home and organized Senchi. Having gone to Senchi and got Equiadonko and Co. to sleep in nice rooms and eat and drink tea, and came out to tell us they have beautiful rooms to sleep in, nice tea to drink, you put together what you call a homegrown policy. Then ran to IMF with it. 